great. Um, so yeah, I think this is probably the most um, text heavy slide you have to sit through this morning, so apologies for that. But um, I think the first proposition really, and it should be an obvious one really, is that teamwork is really important when we think about stakeholder participation and how to how to take elements of what we know about effective team working and how that applies to running an effective workshop as well. So um, what this table really sets out is, I guess, what on the left is, is what we seem to find in a lot of conventional group working or sort of workshop type settings. Um, where we might find that you know those that are most happy to speak up get more airtime. People might be interrupting each other a lot. Um, differences in views are seen as conflict, and so on. You, you can have a look at the rest in that in that column. Um, so what, what we're trying to move towards, and hopefully some of the tools today will help you get there, is to think about how to make those types of settings more participatory. So it's it's about making sure everyone takes part. There's room to think, there's room to get all the thoughts out, and it, there's room as well for those opposing views to, to coexist. I think that's quite a good word for thinking about opposing viewpoints. Um, and I know I can't see you all, but it might be interesting, you know, if you think about your day to day um, and the meetings you're in regularly, would you say, uh, how many of you would say that most of your meetings are on the left hand side of that, of that table? Maybe a, a show of hands and someone who can see everyone could let me know how many hands are going up. Are there any hands up on that side? No. Yeah. No, well, that's good. And, and so then would, would you say no, then that... No, sorry. No, just um, one. Sorry, carry on. <laughs> would you say then, a show of hands, would you say the majority of your meetings are starting to feel a bit more like those on the right of the table? I've got one as well, and a slightly maybe. Uh, slightly. No, two maybe. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, one. Okay, and I don't know, um, feel free to speak up um, if you have any other examples of, I guess, particular challenge that you tend to encounter if you're in that left-hand side of the column a bit more. Are there any other key it's things not, that you find no, frustrating? Not, sorry. 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 Okay. Go ahead, Fiona. Um, uh, yeah, so I was just going to say that um, I've been in meetings that have potentially kind of moved from the left they've started off on the left and we've managed to move them to the right but my experience of that is that that takes a long time like yeah, we've yeah. done two-day workshop things where it's all started a bit like it is on the left and by the process of kind of working through stuff we've got people across to the, to the right but it takes a really long time okay well that, that's that's positive i think as well um it's uh yeah that's a good point to make about the time factor and i guess that's something to think about as well when we think about the types of tools and how they do need time uh, i guess to develop so th thanks for that does anyone else want to make a comment there i think someone else may be unmuted no no okay um sorry yeah that's i okay. unmuted sorry. yeah I, mean, I think it it depends on the meeting and i think one of the barriers that i found is um you know, I put in the comments about fin fixed mindsets, but fixed mindsets can also be um, colleagues as well that are resistant to change. So it's not just our stakeholders, it's um, internally. And I mean, I'm fairly new to the park and I've been a little bit surprised how to the left these meetings are. And I'll, I'll give you an example. There's, there's two 20 year old girls in the team, I shouldn't say girls, ladies, women, in the team and they have fed back to me that they do not um, contribute to the team meetings. Mm. And it just makes my blood boil because they are seen by the dominant forces in the meeting to not have a, a contribution because they're not, they're not technical, but they've got other strategic skills. So I, I, I suppose what I'm trying to say is it's, it's not just when we're dealing with externals, it's also um, colleagues as well that need a, a shift in perception at times. Absolutely that's a really interesting point and um, yeah we should come back to that particularly how to sort of I guess make sure those different skills can be heard as well. Or, or, or well. actually how, how can you begin to influence the meeting when you're not the one chairing it when you're a yeah. participant and you can see these dynamics going on mm -hmm. dominant voices taking over other voices just not getting a chance to be heard so yeah interested okay. in that okay thank you that's super um and i'll um i'll just move on actually unless 
but speak up if there's anyone else wanting to say something but I think that point you mentioned there as well um sorry I can't remember your first name I've not got my chat up it says McFarn on your name um, uh, Nicola. Nicola Nicola thanks sorry. Nicola cheers um I think that that point Nicola's made is is really important so we should definitely come come back to that as well in terms of hierarchy because one thing I wanted to mention just now as well is how to how to raise those sort of challenges without doing it in a way that it's almost having to go behind people's backs as well to raise that challenge. How can you do that transparently as well to say, okay, we need to change how this is functioning. So um, thank you for that. And just some, some other suggestions then as well. I think on the left-hand side of that table on the last slide, um, people still have a lot of difficulty listening to each other's ideas because we're often rehearsing in our own mind what, what we want to say. Um, before that person has finished so we're thinking about our next contribution so ideally in a participatory meeting people are able to listen to each other's ideas because they know they feel confident that their own ideas are going to be heard as well so that's something we need to create space for um, as well we don't want people to be quiet on the controversial matters um, because especially when people don't know where each other stand on an issue so in that more participatory context there should be space for everyone to be able to speak up on those difficult issues um, and understand where where everyone stands on an issue. And that's really quite, quite crucial in terms maybe of the uh, the point that Fiona made a minute ago in terms of shifting um, uh, the, the dynamic. Um, it can also be hard, I think, as well to give accurate representations of the opinions of others if they're not the same as yours. So in a participatory meeting or a more sort of effective workshop and hopefully members of the meeting can actually accurately represent other people's views. So it's not just about being able to get your voice heard, but it's being able to reflect on what other people are thinking and represent those views, even if even if they don't agree with them. And I just popped a couple up here as well, a few more um, other aspects that we need to, to think about how to make sure people don't talk behind each other's backs maybe out of the meeting how can we have those conversations visibly um and again this relates to what you were saying a moment ago in terms of opposition from the person in charge uh, how can we make sure people are encouraged to stand up for their beliefs within a meeting and and also i guess try to make it so that a problem is not considered solved until everyone who is affected by the solution understands the, the reasoning for getting there so again it, it's that ability to understand other people's perspectives and be able to to represent them and I think the last point that that box there understanding the reasoning behind solutions as well I think when you get to the end of a process or an outcome when people make an agreement um, in a participatory context we want it to be assumed that the decision still reflects that wide range of perspectives so it's not a sort of some people agree, some don't. We want to uh, understand that there are still a range of perspectives within, within the outcome. Okay, so the second proposition then is, is when we're thinking about um, how to convene more productive or collaborative workshops, I think it's important to understand why things go wrong in the first place. Uh, so uh, getting to the start of, from the start of a discussion to the end isn't quite like this in practice. I think, I think we all know that. So that gives me to, brings me to this second point that the hardest part of um, collaboration and consensus building or conflict resolution, however we want to frame it, is getting through this idea of, of the grown zone. And there's been some sort of research on, on this idea as well, which I quite like. I quite like how it's framed. Um, so if you think about it, here's a way to see group dynamics at a meeting. So if you imagine people starting to discuss a difficult problem or thinking about, in this case, you know, a vision for a particular part of um, the area within the RLUP or a particular land use, the first person might say, OK, I think we should do A or B or C. You know, they've got some ideas about what, what they think we should do. And someone else might say, actually, I, I disagree with that. I think it's a bad idea. And someone else might say, I think that actually idea X or Y is better. They've got, they've got some alternatives. Someone else might say, I don't think this is even a problem. You know, why, why are we talking about it? And someone else might say, well, shouldn't, shouldn't Joe or someone else be here to discuss this topic? You know, how can we talk about this without, without them being in the room? So then what we see is later in the meeting towards trying to make a decision or reach an outcome. It's not really uncommon to see the very same people um, at the start and how they behaved here behaving quite differently. So for example, the group on the right um, some of them might have agreed to spend 10 minutes just focusing on the pros and cons of idea A, for example. And maybe after that, they shift their attention to the pros and cons of idea X. And a lot of the uh, more interesting nuance and the different perspectives and ideas get lost a bit in, in that process. 
So what was sort of in some of the literature and some of the research behind this is what we see is we see these different types of thinking. And at the start, we see quite divergent thinking, I guess. People start to open up. They start to think about different ideas to come to the table. And ultimately, we get towards this idea of convergent thinking as well. And just at the bottom of the slide there, there are some examples of the types of activities that might commonly be used in these types of uh, stages of the process. So can, any, can anyone relate to this, these sort of earlier and later stages of the processes, maybe an example of where you've seen this sort of divergent thinking or convergent thinking? And any reflections on that and whether it worked well in practice? It's fine if you don't, but if something came to mind, just, just speak up. Okay, well, I think because in real life, I guess we, we can probably guess where I'm going with this, that real life, it, it's most likely to be messier than what that diagram is showing. And, and that, that, that middle area, you know, what, what happens there? How do we get from the beginning to the end? And that period of time is generally quite a stressful time for groups. Um, maybe people repeat themselves, people might interrupt. It can be grueling to communicate across the different uh, points of view in that process. And that, that's where we need to focus our, our effort. And I'm sure that many of you will recognize that period of frustration and misunderstanding from your own experience. Maybe again, a, a show of hands if you think that's quite a common experience. And if anyone wants to share a particular example, um, by all means, just to, to jump in. But I think you would probably agree it's very common, um, this sort of phase of, of the process. It's not easy to get from the divergent thinking to the convergent thinking. But I think what what's, um, I would suggest, and I think Mark will probably be on a similar page, is that the reality is that if the group truly wants to reach a sustainable and collaborative agreement, which I'm sure is probably the case, you know, in the context of working on the the RLOFs, the the, the land use frameworks, and getting there, um, and spending time in that grown zone is unfortunately critical. <laughs> it's where the effort needs to be put in. So we need this time, I would say, to move from those sort of competing frames of reference that we have when, when we start with a group. Um, and getting towards uh, more of a, a shared framework of understanding and appreciation of each other's views and understanding of each other's views. Um, but, but that building of shared understanding and being able to turn that into tangible outcomes and, and next steps is, is really, that's the turning point in any, any collaboration. So that brings me to my third um, proposition, is that the grown zone needs some really structured tools, I think, to help to get through it. And if you look at this diagram, um, what we what we would see is that people generally bring to the table in the first instance, they bring their positions. And that tends to be their negotiating stance in any discussion. And it's pretty hard um, in any participatory process to move from conflict to cooperation around those particular positions that people have. But once you dig a bit deeper below the horizontal line, what we tend to find is that people's positions tend to obscure their interests and their values, as well as their needs and fears around any particular process they're involved in. And it's much more likely that they'll have shared interests and shared values, um, shared needs and shared fears. But often we don't necessarily have the time or the tools or the, the space to explore those in enough depth. And a lot of Mark's research, research has sort of shown that as well around understanding the different values of people involved. So the argument then is if you can make structured time and space for people to explore their shared interests and values, um, rather than focus on their positions uh, or the cooperation or consensus building then is in theory, anyway, I'd say in theory, uh, much more, much more likely. So in practice, if you only enable people to explore their positions when you think about designing workshops or participatory processes, um, and you're thinking about looking for common ground in the grown zone, you're going to end up stuck in this mode of positional bargaining. And I just put some examples there on the left of the screen there. Um, so then people tend to focus on defending their positions rather than understanding the interests of others. And arguably the only real best outcome in that, in that scenario is compromise. But if we can focus on, the, in the first instance, on developing the relationships between stakeholders, and understanding their underlying needs and concerns and fears, like in that sort of pyramid diagram, then hopefully it becomes easier to apply more sort of joint problem solving and reach some shared 
and in this case, hopefully innovative um, solutions, which is what it's really all about. And that's where conversations focused on finding common interests and reaching general agreement um, are really important, but they do need um, structure and they need to be tailored to the specific situation. So let's just suppose a group has brainstormed a list in the divergent zone that we had on, on the left over here. In theory, the next task is quite simple. Maybe the group would sift through ideas, pick a few to discuss in depth. Um, but in practice, that can be really grueling. Um, everyone has their own frame of reference, like I said, their, their positions I mentioned just now. And what's more, when people, I think when they misunderstand each other and they become more confused, they become more impatient, maybe more self-centered and more unpleasant generally to deal with. People repeat themselves, they interrupt, they dismiss each other's ideas etc and, and that those are sort of self-reinforcing self-repeating behaviors and I think you can agree as well then without a facilitator uh, that cycle is going to continue until participants give up pretty much altogether and um, anything just to, to get them out of the room probably at that point so it's just really to reiterate the the point here that it's crucial that people understand each other's perspectives in this middle grown zone and the simplest way to help them to do that um, I think is to sort of encourage them and help them to ask quite direct questions of each other and listen carefully to their answers. And it, it seems like common sense, but that can be really, um, really valuable and using uh, and enhanced, I guess, by using the, the standard facilitation techniques and some of the tools that we'll talk about. So just a few points, I guess, when thinking about designing workshops and the methods that you might want to use. Um, it's very important that people can ask questions, but it's also important that they're not perceived as criticisms. And I think that's often the case when people question each other's uh, perspectives. So as a facilitator, it's important to help people understand that questions are not attacks. Um, we can allow someone to make a statement and then invite people to ask questions and then so to make sure that everyone in the room understands uh, the perspectives of, of the person who's sharing um, their view and why they feel so strongly about it. So in that case, you're promoting understanding through this process rather than resolving differences. People generally, I think, when they come to a meeting or a workshop, are quite interested to find out where others, others stand on an issue that you're discussing. Um, but it's often not clear how or when to raise those issues for discussion. And that can create a bit of a dilemma. So it's you need to think about how a group can devote enough time to understanding those concerns so that people don't become withdrawn or, or impatient, but not so much time that the agenda becomes derailed by, by topics that might be seen as being a bit tangential by, by other members. So a simple exercise can be, uh, for example, asking people to write down one or two meaningful questions that if they knew the answer would help them to participate more effectively. And then you can ask people to explain um, their questions to the group and get answers from everyone. A third point is that if you think about facts and opinions, and we, we talk a lot about fake news, I guess, these days, but there are ways to ask people to categorize their thoughts on an issue and then decide if they think they're actually fact or whether they're an opinion or both, maybe, if they're not sure. And this can be really helpful so everyone can see, um, I guess, how people perceive the information or the evidence they have on an issue uh, and allows time for reflection on that. I think, uh, and this sort of maybe rings true with some of the points about working with colleagues or um, different types of stakeholders. Someone mentioned, I think, private landowners in the chat. Making time to help people understand the nuances of each other's roles can actually be quite important as well. You know, how does this affect their actual work or their job? And then it helps people to understand the different perspectives. So taking time to enable people to understand how a proposal or a possible outcome is going to affect their role um, might also help understanding different perspectives it's important to take tangents seriously i know we said we maybe want to try and avoid tangential conversations but often they can be a real source of frustration in the grown zone so if someone raises an issue that maybe seems peripheral um people might become nervous they don't want to talk about it it's that sort of hot potato that they don't want to think about but it's also important to understand people's views on those side issues um, as they may I guess they may affect the group's ability to deal with the main issue that you're actually 
uh, there today and there are some nice tools around parking those ideas and and having time to come back to them at each meeting and finally i think just to think about the power of the small group exercises and thinking about people who might stay quiet in the main meeting and don't feel they can share their thoughts and that's where you know small groups are really valuable to ask that question you know is there anything you're not saying or that, that you want to share and then you can ask others to share those back with the whole group so I think that's just to pretty reiterate, I guess, the point that structured activities in that grown zone uh, that follow clear procedures and develop help to develop relationships as well can really help to calm a troubled group, I guess you could put it like that, and keep, keep it focused and can help with trust and can help with um, making sure that people interpret and understand each other's um, perspectives really clearly. How are we doing for time, Mark? Do you want me to just go through these last few on facilitation, or do you think you might want yeah, to? Yeah, because it's a, a nice segue into the stuff that I'm going to kick off with. So yeah, that would be great if you don't mind. Okay, uh, that's we'll fine. Keep the questions coming in the chat, and we'll make some room for some, uh, some for some questions before we then move into the workshop session. Thanks. So yeah, do let me know if there's anything in the chat that I haven't seen. Um, so yeah, just last three flat three slides from me then. Um, and my last proposition here is that. It you know it probably seems quite obvious the facilitator you know who they are and how they how they run a process is going to be really important in in, in getting through that grown zone um, and I just wanted to raise a few points and again like I say I'm sure you will have experience of being a facilitator but it's often hard especially when you're so invested in the process that you may be helping to facilitate that your role is to steer or moderate the discussion but you're not there to contribute substantively which can be quite a challenge sometimes. And just to note a few um, a few sort of ways in which the facilitator can help to encourage that more inclusive um, and uh, sort of level playing field, I guess, for those people involved. Um, a few ideas here for you in terms of that those beginning stages of the process where we're thinking about the divergent thinking, and how to help to open up the conversation with warmer questions and encourage everyone, uh, encourage time and space for everyone to say what they want to. Um, while also appreciating that there may be different views, as I, as I mentioned before. But your role is also to keep order. It's also to um, try to stop people talking for too long or interrupting, which we all know can be quite a challenge, uh, and asking, making sure everyone does contribute or asking them if they want to contribute, but being, um, I guess, emotionally sensitive enough to recognise when people don't necessarily want to be put under pressure to talk and, and how to read the room effectively in, in, in that sense and keep a keep a positive and welcoming atmosphere. So just, yeah, no small task. And secondly, I think, yes, it's very important. Your role as facilitator is keeping the discussion on track. Um, time, it, time is tight, you know, finding slots in people's calendars for these things, it is really tricky, um, especially if you're doing this online as well, it's a whole new skill set. Um, but there are just some sort of things here to think about, about how you might keep the discussion on, on track, uh, thinking about the clarity of the process, using, different types of tools and different types of questions to whether whether you want to open up a discussion it open up a discussion or close down when you're thinking about making actual decisions or assigning priorities to particular outcomes but it's also the point I was making earlier are crucial it's having that awareness to ensure there's time and space to allow people to clarify what they're talking about or what their positions are I think that um I guess when you go into these types of processes, you you already have a huge knowledge about the types of topics and issues that you're talking about within the ARLUP. But there's sometimes we can assume that others have that same knowledge or they understand the perspectives of others just you know, just as we do. So um, it's good to make sure you have time to clarify uh, people's meanings and perspectives if people appear confused. And just some other points there, more practical points about timing and uh, things like that. Finally, and I think you know, this is hard if, if for yourselves when you're so involved in this process over the next few years, how do you remain neutral in this type of setting um, if you are facilitating these conversations? As a facilitator, we're always encouraged to refrain from commenting or judging on people's contributions, even positively, I've put in brackets there, because um, I noticed I was listening to Spotify the other day and it sort of likes to tell me if I made a good choice on the album that I added to my playlist. And I think, well, oh, well, thanks. And it's like, no, no, <laughs> I didn't need to know that. But do you know what I mean? If you 
even if you positively thank someone from their for their contribution but you haven't given the same level of appreciation or, or um, applause to someone else then you have to try as hard as you can to remain neutral on contributions i've mentioned evoking the ground rules that's something we could maybe talk about if, if there's time or interest how do we ensure that everyone around the table knows what the rules of engagement and discussion are and how can we invoke them if needs be to keep things on track uh, and just think about the non-verbal signs that you give as well and how how your role in the room is affecting the discussion in any way and maybe these will be points again that we, we can talk about a bit more and finally just to avoid leading questions where possible and make sure you do record all contributions if you can whether that's audio recording or taking notes as you go on a flip chart or a, an online whiteboard it's really helpful to have that real-time uh, sort of record of, of the discussion Okay, so on that final slide, I've just left my details and a, a few bit more information about some of the um, material that I've used there today. Um, but like I said, very happy for any of you to get in touch directly um, as well after today. But I think I'll probably pass over to Mark now, if that's okay. Or oh, actually, maybe we want to just see if there's time for questions. If there are any specific questions on what I've presented just now or reflections, yeah. um, I think we might have a few minutes to do that, but I'll just uh, stop sharing. Great. So thoughts, questions, lots to get your head around. Um, as I said, uh, this it comes from a, a rich, rich evidence base. Uh, there are countless books, papers, articles, um, uh, handbooks for practitioners. Uh, and I think it's really useful just to get um, uh, someone like Jane, who has read much of this um, and practiced much of this to digest what uh, what are some of the most important things we need to get our heads around? But even getting our heads around about half of this stuff can still make a massive difference. So, thoughts, questions, reflections, and what you've heard from Jane. Hi, Jane. That that was really interesting. Um, I have some really good advice in there as well. I just I just wondered if if you're in a, a meeting um, often. You come across a situation where there's there's one person that repeatedly asks questions and you know maybe it takes a long time um, and a lot of your time um, and sometimes you feel rude trying to get them to stop talking and let someone else come in. Is there have you any kind of tips on how to kind of deal with that situation when there's someone continually dominating the meeting with their own voice and opinions and others can't speak? Yeah, it's a really good question, Claire. I'm sure we've all been in, in, in that scenario. Um, and I think there's probably slightly different answers for whether that's in person or, or online as well and the type of meeting that it is. Um, I would say if we're thinking about, um, you know, a, maybe a planned and more, I guess, high level workshop, we're actually trying to address something as opposed to a, a more run of the mill meeting. I would say that I've always found that um, actually using timing timers can be quite helpful for um structured contributions to say let's say you planned an exercise um it can be helpful to say you know in the interest of time i'm going to invite you all to make a, a statement or a reflection on what's being said but i'm just going to ask to limit that to a minute and i hope you don't mind i'm going to actually put my iphone timer on and it might beep and i think as long as a facilitator you're quite humble when you su suggest that and you, it's all in the interest of practicality not in terms of making sure everyone is heard you can frame it like that I think that's worked for me in the past um if it's that more sort of repeated meeting setting maybe where you you're meeting regularly and you've got someone that dominates um again so from personal experience I've always found that it's again just the facilitator making sure you know who the facilitator is and who the or who the chair is of the meeting and that chair being welcome and supported to say okay Thank you for your contribution but we need to move on now again in the interest of time i think is always best but if it's repeatedly the same person that you're i guess asking to stop talking and, and not others um it can be tricky because i guess you can feel like you're picking on the one person a lot so sometimes it's up to other members of the group as well to be encouraged in terms of the meeting um behaviors is to raise a hand and that facilitator for example to move on that raised hand as quickly as possible or um but but I think yeah you just have to be brave and be polite and be humble I think when 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 that uh, situation arises but I don't know Mark if you have any other reflections on experiences you've had in that scenario 
Yeah, so I think what we're doing here is we are building a, a conflict resolution toolkit. So the more tools we have, the better, because we've got a plan A and a plan B and a plan C. Um, uh, and so uh, get scribbling, but I'm going to put into the chat um, my book, The Research Impact Handbook, which has two chapters on um, uh, how to more effectively facilitate, manage, design uh, meetings and workshops with stakeholders. Um, so uh, more, more in there. Um, uh, so uh, if I can uh, add something to, uh, to 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 your first idea um, uh, to address some of the other issues that we've been talking about. Uh, so um, uh, the, the the technique that Jane was talking about was something known as round robin, um, where uh, everyone gets a set amount of time or a, a sentence or whatever it might be to give their views. Um, but uh, two additions to this. The first is that I think it's really important that people can always say pass um, because uh, there are certain people who, for lots of reasons, they might be shy, English might not be their first language, uh, they might have a speech impediment, who knows, you don't know what's going on. Um, you, know, you might just terrify the living daylights out of people as they wait for their turn. Uh, so it's okay to say pass, uh, and I validate that by saying uh, if you've uh, someone else has had a similar idea to you, then just say pass, that's better, and we save time than just repeating the same thing again and again. Um, uh, so so we, we're, we're managing the dominant people <laughs> uh, by uh, everyone having a minute or a sentence, uh, but we're also not terrifying the people who don't want to talk in, uh, in, in plenary. Um, the other thing that you can do to help those, uh, those more shy people in particular is before you do your round robin is to say we're going to give everyone two minutes of thinking time and we want to, you to write down your ideas. So here is the open question up on the screen. Uh, two minutes of quiet thinking and writing time, you write down your ideas. Uh, and now let's do the round robin. Uh, and what you get then is a much deeper quality of thinking. Uh, and people are listening to what everyone else is saying rather than thinking desperately about what they're going to, to, to say. Um, uh, and the person who feels very shy can simply read out what they have written and it becomes a lot easier for them to, uh, to, to contribute. Um, so there are lots of other ideas. Um, I was going to share these later on in uh, in my segment, but um, it, this is an important issue. Let's just bring all of that forward right now. So uh, before I just carry on talking, I wonder, uh, I, there are a few of us with experience. Um, first of all, has anyone tried the techniques that Jane and I have talked about so far and discovered that they haven't worked? Why? Uh, uh, do you have any adaptations of your own to these techniques that you find useful that you can share with us? You can write your answer in the chat or you can raise a hand and speak to that. And if you don't have any experience with those techniques, what techniques do you use? Uh, so one of the questions at the beginning was, I want to hear what other RLOPs are doing in this space. So tell us some of your techniques for dealing with dominant voices, dominant characters, uh, politely, respectfully. How do you do this? So I'll give you some typing time, if that's what you're doing, some thinking time. I'm sure you've got things you do. So Rachel, over to you. Hi, um, I've been really interested in how you turn the dynamic, I suppose, from being about opinions and to the sort of offers and needs model. So it's around that reciprocal and very much mutual understanding that everybody has something to offer. And I think going to the points around understanding perspectives and the nuances of what people can bring and it not being rooted in a very traditional sort of what your job is, but who are you and what are you bringing, which perhaps leads us into conversations from a different point. So we're quite early, I think, in how we are beginning to collaborate and seeking ways to do that. And we're in a very rurally, um, the, the dispersed uh, sort of community. So we're considering how do we achieve that um, inevitably digitally, because that does bring a, in the quality of access, but also going to the, the village halls and thinking about the sort of cultural, traditional and familiar and um, 
the sort of the methodology as you'd you'd say that effectively is what people are comfortable with so really interested in how we integrate some of the the thinking around that and some of the offers and needs type work um, in achieving that and and as somebody who went to art school I really believe that creativity and creative tools which are relying not just on people speaking is a really helpful way of making people feel they can bring things in in different ways and through making and processes to open up chat so um so yeah I've seen people what, kind of what, what, creative, so, what kind of creative techniques do you use tell us more well we've just been at the Dernis highland gathering and we had a tent full of interesting hands-on things from painting with soil to having an ideas tree to having chats and our vision document and things there you know so the sort of typical formats you might find but you know integrating music and creativity in different ways um but that's just something we are starting to do so i wouldn't say and be able to speak of a huge raft of activity we've managed to do so far um but i do think it is important to see beyond people's job titles and not effectively to start conversations by sort of that positioning I think that's really 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 important so I think that was the main point I sort of wanted to say that offers a needs model where you start by people offering something I think is really helpful and then they feel more open to saying well what I actually need then is but they, they know they're offering something and then able to ask because they feel more comfortable to do that so um, I'm particularly interested in us perhaps pursuing that as we move forward so okay great sorry someone else was going to say something or not no okay good um so um so let's come back to this question of dominant voices i think we've not um we've not finished this yet um and this is something i was going to tackle later anyway so if you're worried that we're moving on too fast please don't worry we will come we will come back to that because there's a lot more we can do in that space um so um so so this this for me is um one of the most valuable uh, parts of what jane presented and one of the most important but most tricky uh, elements of conflict resolution. Uh, a lot of the stuff that we're going to uh, think about uh, in terms of techniques are about managing conflict as it arises. And we need those because we need to create safe spaces and we need to uh, define ways of dealing with the, the dominant voices as well as the people who won't say anything. Uh, and when a dominant voice becomes offensive and things start blowing up. So we'll, we'll look at all those kind of risk mitigation elements. But the issue there is that we're dealing with the symptoms of the conflict um, uh, uh, and these positions which are butting up against each other and causing angst. And we're not actually looking beneath the surface. And as Jane suggested, that if we do ever want to, to reach consensus, and it's not necessarily the objective here, it can be about creatively uh, learning from tension and from disagreement. But um, if we want a chance of, uh, of consensus, then we need to go deeper. Uh, and look at people's uh, fundamental values and beliefs, uh, the stuff that is actually driving their preferences and hence their positions. Um, uh, and as J Jane said, when you get to that level, you often find significantly more common ground. So uh, for me, there are a whole load of things in this space that you can do and probably should do before you ever even get into the meeting or workshop. And I think this is probably the, 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 the most significant learning point on this is actually the, st the work starts way before the, before the workshop. Um, now, I don't have slides for this because we're doing this in discussion mode. So uh, just to help you follow this, I'm just going to write a few key words um, uh, as I talk. Uh, and the first of these is uh, the idea of a stakeholder analysis. Um, so yeah, I am writing that keyword in there and I'm giving you my uh, advanced guide to stakeholder analysis. This is a, a peer reviewed paper um, that I'm writing at the moment. And in fact, uh, why don't I give you the, uh, the, 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 the paper because the paper has a whole series of examples from my own practice in um, rural environments uh, in conflict type situations. Um, so let me just get you that paper. 
Um, so the paper itself is just full of jargon, um, but the case studies <laughs> um, could be uh, could be insightful, could be useful for you. Um, now, the reason this is important is that, uh, first of all, we need to make sure that we are including all of the relevant people. Uh, and as Jane said, one of the reasons people uh, stall or, or even delegitimize what you're doing is, well, so-and-so isn't involved, we can't do anything. Uh, or we made a decision, uh, but I wasn't, you made a decision, but I wasn't involved, uh, and therefore I'm going to invalidate that decision and keep revisiting and undermining it. Uh, so. Uh, to, to ensure that what we are doing has legitimacy, uh, whether real or perceived, <laughs> we need to make sure that, uh, that we haven't missed anyone important out. Uh, equally, there is a moral imperative here that we don't miss out the people who always get forget forgotten about. Um, uh, so whether that uh, is uh, marginalized groups, uh, vulnerable groups, hard to reach groups, um, uh, so, uh, for example, uh, commuters who are never there, um, uh, holiday cottage owners, recreationalists, etc. Um, we're just focusing on the landowners and land managers. Uh, who are uh, who has a stake? Uh, who do we need to involve? And who are the people that always get left behind? Uh, and uh, can we can we sort? Um, uh, okay, yeah, uh, can can we sort that out? So we've got the uh, the important people uh, who will potentially undermine what we're doing. Uh, they would optimize it. We've got uh, the vulnerable, the hard to reach people. Um, and uh, and the next step then is to actually um, uh, to, to, to reach out to those people. Um, so we're going to find examples of those people um, and hope that they might be broadly representative of other people like them. Um, so yeah, the, these uh, these these commuters or wherever they are, they, where where do they talk? Where do they meet? How can I find out who they are? What are their interests? Uh, they seem completely disengaged from everything that we're doing. Um, but but what is that that point of connection? Uh, huh, uh, they're here because they love recreation. Okay, let's uh, now maybe recategorize them as recreationalists, and that is the thing that they actually care about. Uh, and now we found that one thing that is going to motivate and engage them and get them into uh, into a process for example someone talked about landowners uh, how do i get landowners engaged in this uh, i don't have to engage uh, i got complete control over my land and i'm not going to do anything i don't want to do so uh, everyone can just <laughs> yeah, hive off and do their own thing uh, what is uh, the, the the kind of thing that is going to get a land owner actually engaged and involved uh, and make them realize this is important to them i have to talk to people like this and if i can't access the people themselves i talk to people who work regularly with those landowners who are warm connections of mine and the, the fundamental thing we're trying to do here is we're trying to open a channel of empathy, uh, that sense of these very different people to us. Uh, what is that point of connection with us? Uh, because very often the reason that someone says yes to being engaged is actually a personal connection with you. Uh, and moreover, now that I understand uh, the things that really make this person tick, perhaps now I can communicate what we're doing in a very different way. So with landowners, um, in fact, let me uh, give you another report. So I was um, commissioned with some colleagues recently to uh, do a report for Natural England on uh, how to communicate um, its peatland strategy uh, to different stakeholders. And the key challenge was uh, to um, large peatland landowners um, who are kind of politically opposed uh, and uh, not polit even politically but opposed in terms of their values and um, uh, and beliefs uh, in relation to uh, some of the the objectives of peatland policy at the moment. Um, so let me just get you our report. Um, did that um, word document work for you? Um, Andy. Oh, Andy seems to have dropped out. Um, report. Okay, so there it is as a PDF. There it is. Oops. It's going to work. Uh, link is coming in theory. <laughs> um, uh, and so, uh, so now we get this idea that um, uh, that, that that these 
landowners, for example, when you start talking to them, uh, really dislike the top-down way in which these processes feel like they're, they're being managed. That, yeah, this is my land. This has been in my family for generations. Who should tell me what I need to do with uh, with my with my land? Um, uh, the, this this idea now that um, that that, that we're, we're, our responsibility is as park rangers, effectively, to show people around the the landscape. Uh, that's not who I see myself as in terms of my identity. Uh, perhaps, yes, I see myself as a custodian for future generations. Um, uh, perhaps uh, I, I, I am passionate uh, about leaving the land uh, in as good a condition, if not better condition than it was. And I've got uh, certain indicators that tell me uh, what that good might be. And I might be open to uh, to changing my views on what good might look like, for example. Um, but uh, but don't tell me this is uh, about doing this for a bunch of city people to come out and for me to show them around. Um, yeah. It's about climate change now, apparently, um, and I don't even believe that climate change is, uh, is a thing. Um, uh, but uh, but ultimately, if what I'm doing um, uh, for the climate uh, also uh, enables me to hold on to the plants and animals and the species that I value, that I see as an indicator of what I'm leaving in good condition for the next cat for the next um, uh, 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 generation, uh, then yeah, maybe I do this stuff, but not for the climate, uh, but for other reasons. Um, great, uh, thanks, Andy. Um, so, so we're, we're understanding who are these people. Uh, we're talking to them, we're understanding what makes them tick. These very different values and the beliefs that underpin why they do what they do, why they think what they think. And now uh, we're inviting them to join in a process on their terms. And each of these invites are going to be tailored. Uh, so. Uh, um, uh, as an illustration of this with some of the upland stuff that I've done, I know a lot of us are in uplands, um, uh, and this was uh, getting policy engagement, but it works exactly the same. Uh, for some people, you can say this is about the climate, it's about biodiversity, and they'll be like, yeah, of course, I'm all in. And that was our experience when we started the journey towards the Peatland Code with a, a Labour-led government. Uh, we then got a coalition government uh, with a Conservative minister who was a climate denier. Uh, and so we're not going to deny this is about climate change and biodiversity, uh, but we're going to point out that there is a policy mechanism here that could be about private public private partnerships that you might be interested in. All of a sudden, at that level of values and beliefs, yeah, okay, I'm interested in this. A landowner interested in this because, uh, okay, there's carbon that has a value. This is a new asset. Uh, okay, I'm in. <laughs> Uh, then we've got a new minister who's not interested in this, um, uh, but uh, is uh, 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 pro-Brexit, um, has a lot of hill farmers in his constituency. Uh, oh, actually, this mechanism can put more money in hill farmers' pockets than Europe can. Um, uh, and again, OK, that's what makes me tick. It's about um, having people on the land, uh, working the land, uh, keeping sheep, keeping a way of life. Uh, and yes, it's about climate change and biodiversity, but here's how you can also retain that cultural heritage um, or whatever else it might be. And what we're doing in each of these cases is we're reframing this based on their interests. And this is not manipulative because we are being very clear about what this is fundamentally about for us, but it's also about this. And so I'm gonna headline the stuff that uh, is relevant to you. And now we've got people engaging. Uh, one final thing I'll do, I'll do with the stakeholder analysis uh, is I will consider who to invite uh, and who to avoid. Uh, so the first point is I need to make sure I, rep I represent all of the relevant interests. And so uh, I might do a stakeholder analysis, which has over 100 organizations I could, in theory, invite to a process. We don't have room, we don't have time, we can't facilitate discussion. So let's categorize these. Uh, and you'll see lots of examples of these in, uh, in, uh, in my paper. Uh, we've now got eight categories. We now need to have a minimum of eight people in the room, uh, one per category. OK, this category is really diverse. We need to have two or three people. And this category, there's two really important people that have to be in the room. OK, now we're up to maybe 12, 13 people, but we've represented uh, everyone that we need. Um, uh, there can be, of course, of people you may want to exclude. So uh, there was a, a land agent um, in the Peak District uh, that uh, had a, a re that was renowned for sacking his gamekeepers and other staff um, uh, uh, if they disagreed with him publicly. Um, and so uh, he was a known character. 
Uh, and um, and so uh, we identified him up front, and he was clearly not going to get an invite. Uh, however, uh, he, we also were told he had a fairly large ego, uh, and so uh, we went and said uh, that you're very special, and therefore you're going to get a one-to-one -one, uh, meeting with the project leads uh, who will get your views, and we will make sure that then your views are represented in the in the meeting. Uh, but we know that you're busy, so we're going to be able to now uh, adjust this around your diary, um, uh, and uh, and you're going to get privileged one-to-one -one, uh, access to to the process. And then he fell for that. Um, uh, <laughs> Uh, and personally, I'm quite happy to manipulate people with large egos, uh, if that's in the interest of the group. Uh, I'll let you decide the, the appropriate, appropriateness of this, appropriate, appropriateness of this. Uh, but great. And another one in uh, in the south of Scotland, uh, and hopefully you don't uh, know who I'm talking about, but there was a very vocal um, shepherdess uh, that we were warned against, uh, and we were told there's no way that you can exclude her from the process. Uh, and uh, we were warned uh, if she doesn't like what, uh, what's going on, um, no facilitator has yet been able to handle her. Uh, because her technique is that she stands on her chair and shouts over the facilitator. Uh, and so in that case, uh, my stakeholder analysis simply gives me the information I know I'm designing this whole workshop around the possibility that this one shepherdess turns up, uh, which I did. Uh, and then I was in equal measure really uh, upset that she didn't turn up because I designed the whole thing around her and relieved that she didn't turn up because you know, I didn't have that challenge. <laughs> so uh, stakeholder analysis, before you even started uh, doing that homework, talking to those people, empathizing, connecting, uh, inviting people on their terms, now designing around those people. Um, we're going to have a small group exercise, actually. Now, based on what I've learned ahead of time, we're putting these people in different groups <laughs> so that they can't uh, spark off each other, for example. So it, there's something really powerful about this. So there's a bunch of other things we can do pre-workshop uh, that will go uh, even deeper into this issue of, of values and beliefs uh, and start connecting in that space. But what are your thoughts on what I've said so far? Thoughts, feedback, uh, does this work for you? <laughs> uh, I like it. Uh, a toilet chair. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, go for it. Um, yeah, it all sounds very sensible. Of course, time consuming, but but really worthwhile time consuming, mm. I'm sure. Um, and I suppose it's, it's is it being careful not to stray into that space that Jane mentioned earlier of talking to people behind others' backs. Is that the right way of saying it? I am um, tailoring invitations, but making sure that essentially everyone is having the same the same invitation to the same event. There's yes, there is. I think something to be careful about there is there. Uh, you're very right there. Yeah, I'm interested in Jane's reaction on this um, because when I'm doing a stakeholder analysis uh, it will be my team I might invite uh, one or two cross-cutting stakeholders who know more about the stakeholder environment than me if I'm feeling a bit blind uh, but it's a confidential lockdown meeting because we are discussing yeah you need to watch out for that person for example and that is really powerful intelligence um, but equally I don't want all the record of that meeting then going out to that person who now knows that we're talking about how problematic they are <laughs> uh, but I am actually talking about people behind their backs um, uh, and I think in in a kind of a closed lockdown um, meeting with people I trust that is potentially really valuable um, uh, because I don't want to be going into uh, in, into the south of Scotland um, and, uh, and without any warning, having my shepherdess um, shouting at me from her chair. I, I want to go in prepared. Uh, Jane, what are your reactions to that? Because your point is also valid. Um, yeah, it's a tricky one, isn't it? I, th I think when you're thinking about invitations and how people, again, it's like that sort of prep before the meeting. It's what what information can you get you want to get as much as you can I guess before you get around the table so I've we've always found as well it's really helpful to get some sort of feedback almost before the meeting sometimes I know we do sometimes do pre-workshop questionnaires actually when people are there but maybe there's a merit to getting some reflections back from individuals as you invite them in terms of what their hopes and aspirations and fears might be and maybe you could even have a, a question in there are you concerned about participating with anyone in particular in terms of we want to design our group setup or structure in a way that's the most productive are the particular anyone that you would 
um, have had maybe difficulty working with in the past, you know, ask people themselves to maybe share any fears they have about participation if they know everyone yes. quite well. That makes perfect sense. I maybe sort of conflated two issues in my question. I, I suppose it's the it's the tailoring the invitation bit, um, and 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 not sort of being clear that you you are inviting people people to the same event. Um, as in people have the same expectations of what the event is. Um, yeah, so, we, we it's so you, specifically tailored. I'd, yeah, not explain it very well. So you've got a, a PDF. Uh, this is the invitation. This is the workshop. This is what's happening. But I've got yeah, a yeah, yeah, and then it's, it's covering yeah, my headlining. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, and it's that cover that. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so ground rules is one of the things that uh, we're going to be looking at um, as a way of dealing with uh, with with these kind of challenges. Um, uh, Karen saying, "What would I have done if she had turned up?" Um, uh, and we're going to look into that um, in the next segments uh, because the, the, essentially the answer to this is that you can. Uh, design your workshop uh, in a way that makes this super safe um, and avoids conflict right from the outset. Um, and so um, in an ideal world, uh, you have the money to pay a professional facilitator uh, or you have all the skills you need to do this uh, in the way that Jane described in her final slides. Uh, in reality, uh, a professional, professional facilitator is expensive. Um, uh, uh, and it takes time to build these skills and the confidence to use the skills. Uh, but uh, to this day, as a professional facilitator, when I am not sufficiently independent uh, or perceived to be, uh, or where this is really high stakes and really high conflict, uh, and I don't have the confidence, I will employ a professional facilitator. Uh, and they vary. Um, uh, so uh, I, I've got facilitators who will work for seven or eight hundred pounds um, to come along um, for a day's workshop. Um, uh, the, the facilitator who trained me, um, Diana Pound from Dialogue Matters, um, is one of the best facilitators in the world. She's uh, yeah, facilitated stuff for, for UK government, Scottish government, uh, stuff around the Badger Cull, for example, uh, Middle East conflict type stuff um, in the Middle East. Uh, and she will charge uh, on average five to six thousand pounds for a half day workshop um, and up to ten thousand uh, pounds if that's a large group that she's uh, that she's working with. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, you probably don't have budget budget for um, one of the world's best facilitators, uh, but uh, you maybe you don't have budget for uh, someone on the cheaper end of that spectrum. Um, but bear that in mind, uh, where this is high stakes, high conflict, and uh, maybe you're not as independent as you would like to be, uh, you can uh, employ a professional facilitator, and that is one solution to this. So let's continue thinking about this pre-workshop stuff and the question on, on, on accessing values. Um, uh, and so uh, there's a bunch of other things that we can do in this space. Um, uh, and so... Um, so one thing that uh, that I quite like to, to do is um, a, a values questionnaire. So uh, Jane talked about pre-workshop questionnaires, uh, and one uh, questionnaire you can do, uh, it's a, a very standard uh, psychological uh, questionnaire. You can download them online. It's called a Schwartz Values, values Compass. Um, uh, let me just write that. And this is getting at people's value orientations. Uh, so I am biospheric, uh, I am al altruistic. Uh, for me, it's, it's all about tradition, uh, it's all about security. Uh, what are the, 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 these guiding values uh, against which I, I, I run my life? Uh, this is the kind of, uh, these are the, the, the guiding principles that, that drive who I am, what I do, um, th those deeply held um, value orientations. Um, uh, and a very simple thing that you can do then is uh, to then show the responses to that uh, to start with, uh, and you suddenly discover that uh, people have radically similar values at these fundamental levels. Um, uh, but even more useful than that is to then use that thinking. So I've made a bunch of implicit things that I kind of knew but couldn't put into word explicit by answering that survey. 
uh, and now getting people to talk more about those explicit values. Um, uh, and so two um, creative uh, techniques, or in fact, three te creative techniques you can use to do this um, that I've used in the past. Um, so uh, one is something called a photo survey. Um, so there are apps that you can download that will do this for you for free. Um, uh, and you invite people before they come to the workshop uh, to download the app um, and, uh, and, and then uh, take a number of photographs uh, of your RLOP area. And it could be simply just things you love, things you hate, uh, as simple as that. Um, uh, and, uh, and you can then add in um, uh, things for people to write. Uh, they can be questions or just uh, an open text box uh, about the photos that they've taken. And um, when you come to the workshop, you can then put those photographs onto a map that you referenced. Uh, and you can look for hotspots uh, of things people love, things people hate, uh, places where people are taking pictures um, about the same thing and saying radically different things uh, about them. Uh, and now uh, asking that question, OK, so why, uh, especially in those conflict zones, uh, why is it that we have such radically different views of that part of the landscape? Uh, and let's link that back to, to our values and make that more explicit. Another technique I've used is something um, called, so let me just write that down. So this is um, photo survey, and you'll see an example of photo survey actually in that Natural England report. We used it in that, um, and all the details of the app, etc. Uh, the other one is something called rich pictures. So uh, we are uh, drawing pictures, um, and we've got lots of colored pens and paper and such like, um, and I do this online as well. Um, uh, just tell people to get some pen and papers uh, and do it like that. Um, uh, and uh, there's something that we're trying to get them to visualize, um, uh, but that it goes beyond just draw a picture of the landscape. So we're getting people to uh, to visualize something linked to their to their values and how those values are expressed in this landscape or through the decisions. Um, uh, so I think Jane maybe was in a, in a workshop we did with Rich Pictures a, a while ago where we're, we're, we're asking people to, to visualize uh, knowledge exchange process. How, how, how does this work? When you put people with different knowledges in a room, what happens? Um, uh, how, do, how might you visualize that? And so lots of metaphorical kind of images that force people to go much, much deeper uh, in, uh, in their thinking. Um, uh, but the, the final one that I've used is storytelling. Um, uh, so uh, you get people uh, to, to tell a story. Um, and with all of these doing small group work around the photos, uh, around the rich pictures, or just paired uh, exercises to explore this, uh, then helps unpack this and take this a step deeper. Uh, but in the in the small groups, I'm asking people to take it in turns, and maybe only one person does it, uh, maybe we do it in pairs, to tell a story about your experience of this landscape uh, that connects to one of these really deeply held values. Uh, and make sure there's a there's a beginning, a middle, and an end. Uh, use your senses to describe uh, what this felt like, sounded like, etc. Uh, so, and people do this, and uh, you get these incredible stories that come out. Some of them heart wrenching stories or surprising stories that stay with people. Uh, and what is happening in all of these uh, uh, as we talk uh, about our values and now explore them through these creative techniques and through group work is that we are opening channels of empathy. And these people who have completely different preferences and positions to us, we see have really, really similar values and beliefs and principles that are underpinning this stuff, uh, have similar experiences. And, uh, and this is what then helps us to get out of those ruts uh, and stop now talking with my organizational hat on in the rut of my position to connect with you as a person. Um, if you're really brave, uh, you can also do um, uh, kind of group building um, exercises. Uh, so in one project, uh, we got our funder to pay for pub lunches, uh, including beer. Um, and before we did our, uh, our, our, our group work, we had a lunch together. Yeah, the desi design to just simply get people connecting on some non-work level to see if they can find some, some common ground, some common humanity in these people that they might uh, normally hate. Uh, and, uh, and of course, if you're putting the people together who, know, who uh, you know hate each other, you need a bit of guts to do that. Um, uh, but, uh, but if you feel like it, you can, you can try something like that. Um, uh, and uh, and then um, uh, linked to that, you can also then do icebreaker exercises. So um, uh, you can get people to do something in that icebreaker that connects with something deep. 
um, uh, so um, uh, a, a, a memory from this landscape uh, uh, in a sentence um, or come with an object um, that means something to you uh, in relation to this landscape uh, and talk about it in a pair uh, uh, to, to start the day off or something along those lines. Uh, and crucially, what we're doing now is we're connecting people again on that deeper level rather than people grandstanding and saying, well, I am the most important person because of all of this and now intimidating the hell out of everyone. And we don't allow that to happen uh, because instead of uh, introductions in the normal way, uh, we do an icebreaker. So loads and loads of ideas, thoughts, reflections, uh, especially Lizzie, because you were asking about the creative stuff. Uh, I've given you a few other ideas. But what I've been doing with this is explaining for me that the value of, uh, of creative techniques is their ability to make implicit stuff explicit. And in relation to this really crucial point that Jane was making, the stuff we want to make explicit are people's values and beliefs, because that's where we find the common ground. I'll just say that it was uh, Rachel was um he was talking about experience. Was oh, it Rachel? Sorry, yes. and sorry, I'm Rachel. Rachel. <laughs> uh, Rachel, what are your thoughts on on, on what I've said? I, I just think it's really interesting, and I'm loving all the different examples and the different people that's sparking off my head, imagining all these different characters that we've we've encountered and we're getting to know better now, and um, and looking forward to sessions that Lizzie and I and others will now think about bringing together. So um, yeah, some really good notes. Thank you very much. Lots resonating. Excellent. Um, so let me see, uh, we've got half an hour left. And um, what I wanted to do with this session is just to build a toolkit. Uh, and I think this is best done through conversation, um, uh, example, etc. Uh, but a, a few things I'd like to get you to think about to help structure some of these tools in your mind and make them more useful. So here are the two chapters in my book that we're talking to. And as you'll see, loads of things are really valuable in this. Uh, the, the GROW model here comes out of the, the coaching literature, but you can apply it to a, a group setting uh, to get a group uh, to design a process, I would argue, uh, or a single meeting or workshop, but ideally a process that takes you um, uh, to some really practical group um, uh, uh, outputs. Um, but um, I, I'm going to focus on the important things, given that we've got limited time. Uh, and for me, probably the most important take home message is that I want you to understand the number one reason why workshops and meetings go wrong so that you can manage this. Uh, and this is fundamentally your task. Uh, and if you speak to any professional facilitator, they will tell you that their biggest challenge, their key role is to manage power discrepancies and dynamics, uh, because if left unmanaged to go wrong, that's when everything goes pear-shaped. And think back to your own uh, experience when things have gone wrong. Um, uh, the, 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 the stories I was told of uh, my shepherdess, uh, um, uh, here is someone exerting power uh, in a coercive way uh, that is uh, creating a, a car crash uh, meeting. Um, and our task is to be able to manage those power dynamics. Uh, and so I want to think about a, a series of techniques that can enable you to manage the power uh, uh, without having to be particularly skilled, experienced, or confident, because the techniques manage this for you. And some of these are the techniques that I designed into my workshop with the Shepherdest, <laughs> uh, and we still use, and I use on a regular basis, uh, because uh, they prevent the conflict from even occurring, because we've understood the root cause of that conflict. Uh, so, uh, what we're doing now uh, is I'm going to ask you to head over to the chat and I'd like everyone to have a think. Uh, imagine this scenario. You have to stand in for a colleague to manage a meeting with a group of stakeholders you've never met before. Now, this is not ideal because, as I suggested, I would always do my homework. Um, and even uh, if I can't do that, I'm going to turn up early and talk to whoever else turns up early to find out why they're there and what they want to get out of the meeting. Um, so I've got at least something to go on. But in this case, you have nothing to go on. You know nothing about these people. And uh, you haven't even started the meeting yet, but 
uh, before anyone has opened their mouth, what are the signs you might use that would tell you that there is at least one person in that room who is more or less powerful than any of everyone else, whether that is their own view of themselves, the group's view of them, or something real. They have power of veto, they're the person with the money, uh, or whatever it might be. Um, and what we're doing in this exercise, to keep the, get the answers coming now, um, so non-verbal, and don't just say body language, I want to know what the body language is, and we're going to go beyond body language with this, uh, non-verbal signs that you use. Uh, and as you start doing that, let me just explain what we're doing here, because I'm going to suggest that you are all already expert facilitators. You just don't quite know it yet. Uh, and what I want you to do is to channel your natural emotional intelligence so that you can start to explicitly use this to become an effective facilitator. And uh, we all realize that actually, yeah, the stuff that I do, uh, I can pick up on this stuff. Uh, I'm not quite sure how, but huh, here's some ideas. And now as we codify the things that we're doing instinctively, implicitly, and make that explicit, now I can start to do this on purpose. I can start to look for these as clues on purpose to see how big a problem I might have. And crucially, you can get things wrong. So the more of these different signs I look for, the more I can triangulate. So yeah, someone uh, has uh, has disengaged. Um, uh, and you might give me lots of examples of disengaging body language. I've just sat back in my seat and I'm looking out the window. Uh, is this because they are bored? Uh, is it because they're tired? It's really airless. Um, uh, is it because actually they've just been deeply offended and now they've disengaged? Remember, who knows? I need to add a load of other things into the equation. And now I look for those other signs and okay, I've worked out what's going on. Uh, something just happened uh, and there are a bunch of people who've just disengaged with a big sigh. Uh, yeah, we're here again. Uh, they don't want to be here again. I need to sort this out. <laughs> Um, so, so we're going to triangulate, uh, check this uh, against multiple different things. And finally, uh, we're also not going to be ambushed by our prejudices. Uh, so uh, a, an older white gentleman wearing a suit jacket and a tie just walks into the room and instantly I uh, stop what I'm doing and go over and shake his hand because he must be important. Oops, <laughs> let's make sure that uh, we're not just falling prey to our, uh, to our uh, subconscious biases and prejudices. Uh, and so we're looking for the actual real most powerful person in the room. So that's what we're doing in this exercise and this stuff is powerful. So um, great, who sits at the front or at the head of the table. Uh, there's an innate confidence, uh, a sense of privilege that they may be used to. Uh, who sits at the back, um, if we're at a table, who takes their chair and removes it from the table to create a row by the wall that says, I'm not important, don't talk to me. Uh, and I invite them, uh, invite them in. Um, uh, my most, most nightmare situation was I facilitated a focus group in the Kalahari Desert um, uh, and a local prince turned up. Uh, and I was instantly thinking, yeah, you look different to everyone else. Um, uh, and uh, there was a bunch of logs and there was one plastic chair uh, in this space. Uh, and I'd hidden the plastic chair so we would all sit on the logs. Uh, and the prince found the plastic chair, uh, took it onto a stage that I hadn't even noticed behind us and proceeded to sit on the chair on the stage looking over the rest of us. <laughs> um, uh, hopefully you can all see the, the, the challenge there. I eventually persuaded him to come down from the stage, um, but figured it probably wasn't appropriate to get a prince to sit on a log. Um, so where people sit, who instantly gravitates to, to sit next to that powerful person, um, can I see that going on? Um, who people are looking to moving towards. So we haven't even started yet, but there's someone with a bunch of people crowding around them, others satelliting around, waiting their turn. Someone else sitting, uh, trying not to give anyone eye contact, looking into their coffee mug. Um, uh, uh, <coughs> Nicola, um, this is a powerful one. So eye contact. Uh, and this is a, an advanced facilitation skill um, most people are not aware of, so I'm impressed that you've picked up on this one, um, because we all resonate with this, but uh, uh, who gets most eye contact when anyone is speaking? In particular, look, when someone opens their mouth, who do they first give eye contact to? And at the end, who do they give eye contact to? 
And what's going on here is uh, that um, uh, Jane is the most important person in this room, uh, and therefore uh, I'm going to start talking and I'm making sure Jane is listening to me. Great. Uh, and you're looking at your phone. Great. Fantastic. Because I'm going to say something important that I want you to uh, respond to. Uh, and I'm going to say something, I'll look at maybe two other people who I think might be important, ignoring everyone else. Uh, back to Jane. Yeah, you're still with me. Fantastic. Uh, and now I finish my point, uh, effectively giving the floor to Jane to now give me what I want as the most powerful person in the room. Um, and if you are that person and you didn't think you were that person, you will suddenly feel very visible uh, and slightly awkward. <laughs> uh, and if you are that person that nobody thinks is important, you will literally feel invisible. Uh, and so one of the things I'm doing as a, as a, uh, as a, uh, as a facilitator is I am sharing out eye contact. So I make sure I do not fall into that trap and I give everyone equal eye contact. And it turns out there's a few people that don't seem to be very powerful who've clustered together at one end of the table, um, for example, um, and nobody's giving them eye contact. And so now I, I'm getting eye contact because I'm standing up or I'm the facilitator. Uh, fantastic. There are people over here. Really good point. And yes, there are people still over here. Uh, great. Uh, and now, does anyone want to say anything in response to this? There are people over here. Uh, great. Uh, it's trying to share that out. Um, uh, so, um, so have a look at this um, uh, and uh, analyze this, uh, and instantly we're getting information. Uh, but that's going into the conversation. Um, Great. So a lot of these things, uh, they're, they're, they're signs of confidence. Um, and so what we assume is if you're confident, there must be a source of power behind that confidence. Otherwise, you would not be confident. And of course, it could be wrong, but um, uh, but uh, but confidence is a sign. Um, and um, uh, without being too sexist, uh, I'm going to suggest man spreading. <laughs> it's a nice example of this. Uh, but people who um, uh, have very open body language, but body language which takes up space and even encroaches in other people's uh, uh, space. Um, uh, so it's open, uh, it's expansive, it's confident compared to closed, um, uh, uh, shy, retiring, hiding. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not really here. <clears throat> um, uh, and uh, on a low body language stuff um, uh, is culturally dependent. Um, uh, the, those kind of generalizable principles do tend to work. Uh, even what people wear. Um, and again, it depends on the, on the context. I was at a, 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 it was a government committee um, and the chief executive or whatever it's called of Friends of the Earth turned up. Um, everyone else was wearing suit jackets. I wasn't wearing a tie, but I was smart. And he turned up in a faded t-shirt and ripped jeans. Um, and actually, that was his power play. <laughs> I'm not like you. I'm different. I'm, a he I'm here to disrupt. <laughs> um, uh, so it was subtle things like that. Um, uh, so uh, online, uh, camera on, leaving small talk. Um, uh, he, uh, yeah, there could be a very powerful person who doesn't have the, their camera on. These things are harder to, 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 to pick up on um, uh, non-verbally uh, before things uh, start. Uh, but let's uh, make sure we get to all the other techniques that we, we look at how they work online as well. Um, uh, loads of things, yeah, how you name yourself. Uh, so I've got an instant power play. Uh, I'm a professor. Uh, and actually, uh, I'm also an ally uh, to, uh, to, to various uh, disadvantaged uh, groups. Perhaps that tells you something about my values, my politics, even. Uh, perhaps you're wrong. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> um, uh, uh, great. <laughs> yeah, so let's let's just quickly think about the the camera thing. Um, so we all want people to have their cameras on. I didn't do this today, um, but it's a lot easier. Uh, it doesn't really matter today. But if I want to read people's body language, are you paying attention or not? Having cameras on is handy. Uh, but I would say you cannot uh, tell people to put their cameras on. There are lots of good reasons why people don't want to. And the, uh, the most salient lesson for me was um, a friend of mine who told me that because of things that had happened to them online uh, and horrific things, uh, we're, we're talking abuse type stuff, um, they, uh, uh, they get psychologically triggered if they see themselves on camera, on screen. They cannot do it. 
Uh, it's just a psychological impossibility for them. Uh, and that's a really extreme example, but to just to point out there are good reasons uh, and you could really be challenging people uh, if you tell them to put their cameras on and instantly putting people offside. So what I do uh, is uh, when I turn up early, <laughs> unlike today, uh, I, I start with each person who comes in. Uh, <clears throat> I say, ah, hello, great to see you so-and-so use their name. Uh, I wait for them to say uh, uh, hello, uh, and I start talking to them. How are you? It, it's, what kind of a day is it where you are? Uh, and instinctively, uh, because my camera is on and I'm talking to you, uh, the, 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 uh, we can't help it, I put my camera on. And if people don't, they will always apologize and explain, great, it's fantastic here. Sorry, I can't, can't put my camera on today because of this. I didn't ask them to put their camera on, but instantly get they get this. Uh, and so now um, I've got two people have joined, the two first two people, first three people now uh, I've introduced. I said, hello, how are you? What's things like today? Uh, and they've put their cameras on. Uh, now, person number four comes in. Everyone's got their cameras on. That must be the group norm. I put my camera on. Person number five, uh, and you get this self-fulfilling prophecy, uh, and everyone puts their cameras on uh, at the beginning of, uh, of your meeting. Now you've got that non-variable stuff, uh, but you've not had to tell anyone to do it. And I will still validate uh, to people, because uh, normally people will come on. There will be someone who doesn't want to. They feel suddenly awkward. Uh, just to say, I'm not putting my camera on for this reason today, guys. That's fine. Be my guest. No pressure to put your camera on whatsoever. And yet, <laughs> we're, now, we're, all, we're all now doing it. And again, I'll let you decide whether I'm just being highly manipulative or not. Uh, for me, I'm doing it in the interest of the group, therefore I don't mind doing that. Um, <clears throat> uh, also on camera, especially as facilitator, uh, I think it's really important to have uh, as few barriers as possible. So uh, as James got uh, some in-ear headphones, and I think that's perfectly fine. Now, I personally find it uh, distracting to have uh, big headphones over uh, over me uh, in the same way that uh, I don't want to have a lectern in front of me or a clipboard as I'm speaking. It's just that barrier between you and your audience uh, when you're trying to create connection. Um, uh, it, backgrounds as well. Uh, so um, I want to have a, an authentic background that is me, not a corporate background with a logo on it. Uh, and if I haven't got uh, uh, in a shared office space and I'm graying that out, um, uh, but I'm not putting in a corporate background, I'm trying to create that sense of connection. I'm a real person <laughs> with people. Uh, so we started talking uh, here about some of the online tips and tricks. Uh, pile in on the chat and share your tips and tricks, or, or if you disagree with me. Um, I want to bring this back to the point, though. Um, so we'll come back to that later, if that's OK. But. Uh, what we've done here is we've made explicit and codified some of the things that we can use to manage, sorry, to identify the, the power dynamic. And in fact, I don't, I don't need my slide for this point. Um, and so if the number one reason things go wrong is power dynamics left to go wrong, unmanaged, then our task is to manage those dynamics. And to do that, the first step is to understand the dynamic. And that's why this is so important and why I'm spending time on this. Uh, and I'm gonna suggest that the scale of your challenge and the likelihood of conflict in particular is proportional to the number of people who are high versus low power and high <coughs> how high and how low you work out their power seems to be. Uh, if you go into a group, and actually there, everyone seems to be a very similar level of power, um, uh, then uh, you're probably not gonna have too much of a challenge. Um, uh, and yet, uh, most, in most cases, you can spot at least some dynamic. Um, and for me, as long as I've got one very powerful person and one uh, really unpowerful person in the room, I know I've got a problem. If I've got more than that, I've got a big problem. And so I now I'm going to manage for that problem to avoid conflict from arising. And the very first mistake most people make is that they use the most feared facilitation technique of professional facilitators. You talk to any professional facilitator, they will tell you the thing they fear most is open discussion. 
And yet it is the thing that we all just do because that's what you do in meetings, isn't it? Uh, and in fact, I do that all the time and it works fine. Uh, but actually, are you facilitating people who are very different to you and in conflict with, any, with each other? Uh, and even if, uh, if you are uh, and you still think it works, actually ask yourself, does everyone always get a chance to speak? Uh, and if they do, ask yourself, to what extent is the airtime in any way equal? between those people. And most people, by the time I finish asking them those questions, realize, yeah, I'd open discussion on a regular basis. And no, it doesn't really work. I'm kidding myself. <laughs> so open discussion is hard <laughs> if the goal is to get everyone to speak and not to allow anyone to dominate. And you need to be a really skilled, experienced and confident facilitator to make that work. So this is not to say that we have no discussion. Clearly, we need them. But we're now going to structure that discussion using techniques, and we're going to bound that discussion to keep it really safe. So I'm going to give you a, a, a few other tools in your toolkit, and I'm going to give you a structure within which to think about this, which will map on to some of the stuff um, that Jane talked about. Uh, this slide is just uh, saying there's loads more on this stuff, uh, yeah, the deep stuff. <laughs> Uh, that helps you preempt and now pre-manage for, <laughs> for conflict um, uh, and some of the, 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 the signs that things are going wrong. Uh, and we'll have a think about uh, how you manage that um, uh, later on. Um, but uh, at, uh, at this point, we're going to have a look at some methods and I'm structuring these as opening up techniques um, uh, that get everyone talking, loads of ideas out there, uh, but to do that in a fair way, so everyone gets a chance um, in a way that nobody can dominate. Uh, we're going to then move into an analysing phase where we think critically about this, and this is where we're also then going to connect through to people's values and beliefs and try and get beneath the positions. Uh, and we've talked about many of those techniques already. And then um, uh, optional, uh, but in many cases, we do have to make a decision. And that's where everything that was going well suddenly goes wrong. Uh, and so let's think about some ways of doing that safely, carefully, but also critically and connecting still to people's values. So what I would like you to do, no, so let me just think, um, no, I did this already. So. Um, uh, I added this in earlier based on what you all said um, uh, in the chat. Um, uh, and um, yeah, so let me, there's there's one that we've not answered, so we'll come back to that at the end. Um, but for now, um, we've covered that as well. Let's just dive straight into this task. <clears throat> so this is an individual task. <clears throat> and uh, keeping an eye on the time here. Um, your task is to try and work out, I'll leave this as a rhetorical question, but I'll keep pausing. Uh, how do the techniques manage the power dynamics for you? So uh, let's start with opening up. Um, and we could do a round robin uh, with the option to pass, crucially. Um, uh, we could change that round robin up by giving everyone two minutes to think and write before they do the round robin. Um, great. Uh, we've got now everyone has said something to start with. Uh, an alternative to this is something called meta plan. So I'm going to give everyone now three post-it notes each. And we can do this online. The, the, uh, the tool I use is Google Jamboard. I'll show you this uh, in a moment. And here is my question. You've got up to three different answers. You can give three different ideas. As soon as you've written at least one idea, I want you to come to the front and stick this on some big flip chart paper on the wall so we don't get a big crush at the end. Look at what everyone else has read. If you've got a similar idea or the same idea, cluster similar ideas together. I stay at the front helping to cluster those similar ideas. And in about five minutes, even with a large group, now everyone has got their ideas up on the front. And I can see we've got now 10 different clusters. This is what the group thinks in answer to this. So hugely efficient. How, however, did this manage the power dynamic? Rhetorical question. Ask yourself. It should be fairly obvious that the dominant person who in open discussion would have droned on and given you 10 ideas, perhaps none of which were very good, and given no one else airspace, only got three ideas. 
Uh, and if they come to you and say, well, I'm actually more important than everyone else, um, or, or usually it's actually, in my case, academics who say I'm cleverer than everyone else, and therefore I need more post-it notes, the answer is no, everyone gets three. <laughs> um, uh, and that quiet person who, uh, who would have said nothing in the group discussion also gets three ideas. Great. So loads of ideas out on the board uh, or spoken about in that round robin, um, but they're just ideas. Some of them are good, some of them aren't. We haven't been able to unpack these critically. So now we're moving to the analyzing phase. Uh, now we talked about lots of different ways we can do this um, already connecting to the creative arts, uh, but I'm gonna give you a very simple technique, which I use regularly, which is called the carousel technique. And I'll explain how you can do this online as well as face-to-face, -face, which means we're gonna have small group work now. Now, there are two points here about managing the power dynamic. Uh, so the first is uh, we've got enough people in the room um, to do four groups, but we can't do 10 small groups and there are 10 clusters on the board. How do we shortlist and decide what of the four they're going to be? Um, I have a sneaking suspicion that Jane was at this workshop. I did this once and uh, the funder of my research uh, stood up at this point and said, I'm funding this and I think these are the four you need to focus on. <laughs> at which point I was able to say, so thank you, Professor Lowe. Um, uh, and uh, I'm really fascinated to hear your perspective. Uh, I would like you to allocate your sticky dots to those four ideas and everyone else in the room, whatever you think of the top four, I want you to allocate your dots accordingly. Everyone has 10 sticky dots. I'm doing this on Google Jamboard. I'll give everyone five uh, votes to do this um, based on the number of colors uh, that it can uh, handle. Uh, but we've all got the same number of votes, hence the power <laughs> dynamic uh, has been, uh, has been um, uh, resolved. Uh, nobody has more voting power than anyone else. Um, if I love just one idea, I can put all 10 on that one idea. If I think that there are 10 great ideas, I can give one dot each. I decide how I allocate, but I only have 10 dots. And I'll normally do this in a break. Uh, and uh, when I come back from the break, I can see a cloud of dots over maybe five um, of them. Great. So here are the top five. We've only got room for four groups. So let's combine two similar ones together. And I'll take all of those post-it notes and I move them into each of the four corners of the room. So this is the collection of ideas. And now we're going to discuss those top four ideas. And the other ideas, great ideas. We'll write them up. We can come to them in a future session if we want to, but we're going to focus for now on these top <coughs> four ideas. And I'll share what this might look like now in Google Jamboard. Um, can you see that? It's a, it's a bunch of post-it notes. Yep. Yeah, okay, great. Um, so uh, in this case, we've got uh, two Jamboards because uh, there were too many ideas that didn't fit. And uh, at the end of, the, of this, I'm circling each one. I'm summarizing what they might be, maybe have some, having some discussion around this. Everyone gets five votes. One per is this five colors of post-it. I just copy and paste each of the colors to keep track and allocate them accordingly. And great job done. So we manage the power moving from uh, my opening up to my analyzing phase. Uh, but now we're in small groups, I can manage the power even more. So uh, the most common issue is I've got uh, a particular category of person who has more power than anyone else um, because of their affiliation, because of their seniority or whatever it might be. Uh, and so I'll often just call that out explicitly. Um, so uh, if we have any senior managers or anyone with a management role, for example, or whatever it might be, I want uh, you to stay behind in the main room. Do not accept the invitation that's going out uh, now to join your, 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 uh, your breakout rooms on Zoom. Um, uh, and we're going to do some special stuff in the main room um, uh, or same thing. We've got uh, four groups. Uh, but there's a fifth group, and that is for the, the senior people or whatever it is. Uh, and whatever that category is and how you ever, however you name it, what you're trying to do is you're taking out the powerful people from those other groups so that they can't dominate and those other groups feel comfortable just being themselves and talking. 
Uh, now, uh, in some cases, you can do that with a category. In others, you can't. It's just one or two problematic individuals, <laughs> uh, in which case I then decide, um, do I want the problematic people in one group? Uh, do I want them separated? Because that's the issue. Uh, and now we're going to do a numbering thing. Uh, so one, two, great, you're in different groups. Um, uh, <coughs> uh, 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 and uh, 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 Or I, I give everyone coloured dots to start with, uh, and I might claim it's random, um, but in reality there's a little bit of unrandomness where these two people are not in the same group, so they can't hit off each other. And now the small groups are, are, are based on those, uh, those, uh, those, those, those sticky dots. Uh, a worst case scenario, I've got one of my groups kicking off. Uh, uh, my shepherdess is there, um, uh, and, um, and and she's joined one group. I make sure that I have my best facilitator. Uh, whatever resource I've got goes to that group. Uh, and the first sign for me normally is whenever I look over, there's one person talking. Nothing's been written up. Okay, we've got problems. I go and help that group uh, or whoever it is that has um, uh, the most emotional intelligence and confidence, uh, the two criteria you need for uh, being a natural facilitator, deploy accordingly. <clears throat> uh, so uh, with Carousel, uh, final step is uh, we're in our group. We're now going to have um, some time talking about things that we're interested in. Uh, I would normally say go to the group that you have most interested in. You've got most to give first because you get most time there. I get a decreasing amount of time as I move clockwise around the groups. Um, or uh, I invite everyone back to the main room and then say, right, now choose another of these rooms. On Zoom, you can name the rooms, people can self-select, or, or I can just randomize again. Um, uh, but I go into each of these rooms and on Zoom, each room has their own Google Doc uh, and I come into the main room, I get the link and I can see what everyone else has written before I can add to that. Uh, I move to my new station, I see what everyone else wrote. Uh, we've got, each got our own color of pen, we add to that. And the final step is not to do a big, long, boring report back, but we all go back to our seats, uh, looking at the one we started at that we were most interested in to see what has been added to that. So we avoid the big, long report back. On Zoom, I just give everyone links to all of the, uh, the rooms, and maybe over a break, you can go and have a look at what's in all of those uh, Google Docs. Uh, the final step then is closing down or deciding. And uh, there are lots of things we can do in this space, but I'm gonna give you the most powerful of these, which is multi-criteria evaluation. Uh, and so now uh, we're going to go back to uh, those four ideas. Which is the best one? Which one do we want to fund? What do we want to do next? Whatever it might be. And I can do a ticket up prioritization again. But people will often say, yeah, but it's more complicated than that. There are different reasons why we might vote for these. So let's make that explicit. Yeah, so it could save money. It could save lives. It could be good for the environment. <laughs> we're actually getting now to these deeper dynamics, the values, the beliefs. What's actually this? What is this all about fundamentally? And now let's allocate our dots. Yeah, I like this, but for this reason, and I'm putting it in the save lives, saves the environment box. And now we can see we've got two which are popular, uh, but, um, uh, but we can see why. And now based on those values, we might now be able to make a decision. At the end of the day, uh, not everyone will be happy with that decision, but the evidence suggests people are much more likely to say, you know what, I live with this. Uh, I understand these crazy people and how they think now because we made this all explicit. It was fair. I had my say. It didn't go my way. That's life. I live with this. I don't keep revisiting, undermining, delegitimizing, creating conflict. And we move together as a group despite not having reached consensus. Now, uh, we're running out of time, um, but I wanted to give you two brief um, com uh, ways of managing dominant voices, um, and I'm happy to stay a little bit longer uh, for anyone who wants to ask questions. Um, uh, we could clearly spend uh, half a day on this, um, uh, but the first is ground rules. Uh, so someone mentioned this earlier, I think it was Andy. Uh, and the key thing about ground rules is that uh, we say, yeah, this is how we are going to behave uh, today. And we do this up front. Is everyone happy? Yes or no? Do we want to subtract or add anything? Yes or no? And at that point, I get yeses from everyone. We have a social contract. Now, when someone is misbehaving, I can say on behalf of the group, we agree to these ground rules. And for these reasons, I'm highlighting, you may not be aware that you are breaking one of these rules. Uh, and if this continues, I'm going to have to take action. Okay, this is the second time now this has happened. If this happens again, I'm going to have to ask you to leave on behalf of the group because we all agreed. 
And what happens now is it's not you and your power, it's the group's power and the social power of that social contract that means the peer pressure is overwhelming. And although I have had to read the Riot Act, I have never actually had to remove anyone from the room because it works. Second uh, and final of my ideas is going to be any other business. Uh, as you'll see in the book, I always create some flexibility in a program, so I know that I can pull something out, I can shorten something, and in this case we've got problems, we've got a really dominant person, uh, and I'm now going to tell everyone there will be any other business, AOB at the end. Uh, I create an AOB board uh, on uh, Google Jamboard uh, or at the side of the room, uh, and that dominant person, now great, really important points, depending on their ego, they often have a big one, really, really important points, thank you so much, uh, but we need to keep things on track, uh, and so uh, I'm going to ask you to just write this down and we'll come back to this at the end, but we're not going to revisit this for now, uh, and we now we move on. Uh, and anyone else who's got something important that they haven't been able to say, write it on the any other business, we'll come back to it. That person feels they've been hard. Great, I'll get to talk about this again later on. At the end, I make my 15, 20 minutes, we go through them. We don't ask who said what, uh, it's anonymous. Uh, and now, yeah, we might spend a bit of time, but I'm going to have clearly have to make airspace for all 10 of these comments so we can't spend too long on that really annoying thing that you keep wanting to talk about. But we've, uh, we've, we've, we've done our part of the deal, we've come back to it at the end and made a bit more time for it. And at the same time, we have these other comments from people who perhaps didn't say anything at any point, but their voice has been heard as well and effectively took power from the dominant and gave it to the person who wouldn't have said anything. Uh, so apologies, so many ideas. Um, hopefully those, these ideas have answered your questions. Um, uh, uh, I'm going to hang around if anyone would like to just uh, give us some tricky scenarios, challenges, things you'd like to discuss uh, with Jane and me. Um, but I wanted to just try and get a few, uh, through a few more of those ideas. So uh, I'm going to close things. Uh, but before I do so, I just want to signpost. This is the first of, I think, five sessions that we will be doing following up the work that we did um, through the Centre for Climate Change. Um, uh, on uh, using a natural capital approach. Um, and so these techniques are part of a natural capital approach. Uh, we'll be looking uh, back in at the, uh, the, the natural capital assessment type stuff. Um, we've got some stuff on landscape scale collaborations, uh, demand supply side aggregation, landscape enterprise networks. There's a whole load of stuff based on what you said you wanted training on. So uh, do make sure you've got that in your diary. And if you're not sure what's coming up, uh, Claire, uh, maybe you could actually even stick the agenda uh, of what's coming up into the chat. Uh, so it just remains for me to say thank you, uh, to apologise again for running over time um, and to look forward to seeing you again at another of these sessions.